Kansas City, Kansas. First, a KNBC 9 News investigation in Wyandotte County. Former detectives and several former police chiefs now face a lawsuit. A group of women accused them of operating a criminal enterprise and terrorizing the black community for decades. He was a decorated detective, feared and respected on the streets of Kansas City. But behind his tough reputation, Detective Roger Golubsky had a dark secret. He was in bed with the local drug lord, running a sex trafficking ring that preyed on innocent young girls. For years, Golubsky used his power and position to protect the operation from law enforcement, profiting from the exploitation of vulnerable girls. But eventually, justice caught up with him when he was indicted on multiple charges. Even his lawyer's desperate attempts to prove his innocence couldn't save him from the mounting evidence against him. As details emerged during the trial, it became clear that Golubsky didn't just turn a blind eye to the horrors happening under his watch, he actively participated. Using his position as a police officer, he handpicked girls for sexual services in exchange for protecting the trafficking ring. But it wasn't just about greed and power for Golubsky. He was also a violent predator who took advantage of his position of authority to sexually assault women and even teenage girls while on duty. And as if that wasn't enough, Another indictment was filed against him for conspiracy against rights and involuntary servitude in connection with the sex trafficking ring. The ringleader behind this despicable operation, Cecil Brooks, a ruthless man who forced these young girls into horrific acts against their will. One victim bravely testified that she was only 16 years old when Golubsky raped her after pulling her hair and choking her. This is just the tip of the iceberg the full extent of the damage caused by this sickening enterprise is yet to be uncovered. But one thing's for sure, there will be no escape for those involved. Justice will prevail, no matter how long it takes to bring these monsters to their knees. Get ready to take a deep dive into the gritty world of true crime with No Tears for Black Girls, the groundbreaking podcast brought to you by best-selling author John Reedberg. I'm your host, Samantha Paul. You can catch us every Thursday on the Alive Podcast app or wherever you get your podcasts. Today's episode will drag you through the darkest depths with no light at the end of the tunnel. So strap in and brace yourself. This one's gonna be a bumpy ride. Hang tight, y'all. I would have to come down to the police station, headquarters, go to the front desk, and then I guess they would call back and then he would come out and get me. So we can leave and go get in the car. That was his lunch break, but we would go to his house so he could do the oral sex on me. When he called, I had to show up. It was like I didn't have no choice. I knew he was blackmailing me, but I didn't know how to tell somebody really for real. But I knew he was blackmailing me. Mika Hobbs first encountered Kansas City, Kansas Police Captain Roger Golubsky in January of 2006. She was 26 at the time and had just been released from the hospital after being thrown through her shower door by her boyfriend. There was no reason for the homicide captain to be investigating an aggravated battery, and according to court records, he had nothing to do with the investigation. But because he knew there were drugs in the house, Mika felt blackmailed into having sex with him. For years, she says, he took her on creepy rides to his home in Edwardsville and through other parts of Wyandotte County that she agreed to visit again on camera. This is just the area you see my route. There's nobody on this route. This is the route we used to take. Nobody around. This was a whole street that we went down. My mama uh, told me never to go on this street being grown up. Barriers now block this stretch of Brown Avenue east of 21st Street. The sloping road that Glubski would creep along with her is overgrown and impassable. He never drove fast. He just, he, 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 he just like cruised through here. He would just act like he was just driving, looking around as we rode through here. He have a stack of pictures just in his on his glove. I mean, on his dash. Some of them were Porteroid, some of them were obituaries, 
Some of them were just pictures of women in jail. Just mugshot. He was just asking me, did I know him? These women are way older than me. Like, old enough to be my mama. Majority of the women that he showed me had red lipstick on. And we all kept our hair similar. All our hair was similar. The women that he showed me, he said that those are cases that he had. Some of these women that he was showing me that he said he had cases, I thought they were just victims like me. Along my ride, he would make me feel on him and put my hand between his legs and he would ask me, he would ask me about just certain women. And then he asked me what I know about them apartments, Delavan apartments. I don't know nothing about them, my uncle just stayed there. The Delavan apartments were the alleged site of a sex trafficking ring operated by Cecil Brooks, Golubsky, and two other men. They're only a short distance from another stop the detective always made in the area, the overlook at the historic Quindaro ruins. When we came up, we come through here. But we always pass this right here. Come up through there. Right here, he'd pull out more pictures. And he asked me, did I know certain women? Nothing but women. Women victims are, they could have been dead, they could have been alive, you know, but they were all women. Golubsky's route with Mika Hobbs also took them north on 18th Street. Just before the road dead ends at the Kansas River, he'd turn into the Memorial Park Cemetery. Go this way. It's back here. And drive to the children's burial section on the northeast edge of it. Go straight on back. Every time he took me on my route, we cruise through here. He slowed down, glance over here, once again, put my hand between his legs, and then he would just slowly drive off. But he always glanced over here. Yeah. Now look at the rest of the fence. I think there are people that he did something to back there. Because you're just not gonna keep taking me on the same route. Then you're not just gonna keep asking me about pictures, you know? I be thinking about them women. Why would well, he ask me about a certain woman? Well, maybe that's one of the women he did something to her right here. What would closure look like at this point? Closure would look like at this point, it's, it'll be a big relief because my kids know that it wasn't me. He had a high ranked position. That was to keep people safe and to protect people. But now he used that against his, he used it. It's a lot more women that won't, they scared to come, but not I. Roger Golubsky, a small town boy from Edwardsville, Kansas, grew up in the gritty streets of Wyandotte County. Raised in a staunch Catholic family and haunted by the Vietnam War, he sought refuge in religion and attempted to become a priest. But fate had other plans for him. Instead, he found himself wearing a different kind of uniform, that of a law enforcement officer. And with it came a tangled web of deceit and corruption. The whispers started soon after Golubsky joined the Kansas City, Kansas Police Department, in 1975. Questions about his conduct on the job, rumors of excessive force and violence began to swirl around this young officer. But it wasn't until March 5, 1978, that things took a deadly turn. A man named Kenneth Borg ended up dead at the Bethany Medical Center in an alleged case of police brutality. The official report stated that Borg died from internal bleeding caused by a fall during his drunken stupor, but whispers on the street said otherwise. According to witnesses, Golubsky admitted to striking Borg with his nightstick while transporting him from the Gaslight Club to the jail. But there were no witnesses to back up his story. And when the coroner's jury issued their verdict of accident due to self-indulgence, many believed it was a cover-up orchestrated by corrupt cops. A follow-up investigation revealed even more disturbing inconsistencies. 
One juror was married to another KCK cop and knew Golubsky's patrol partner. And a high-ranking police captain served as a bailiff during closed-door proceedings. But the most damning evidence against Golubsky was the polygraph test he passed. Some say with flying colors. It seemed like nothing could stop this smooth-talking cop with connections within the department. It was only later, when another suspicious death occurred under similar circumstances, that people began to question if Roger Golubsky was truly above the law. A freak injury, they called it. But was it really just bad luck or something more sinister? Only time would tell as the investigation into Golubsky's past and present actions was reopened. And one thing became clear. This small town boy had a lot of secrets to hide. Detective Golubsky had always been one step ahead of the game. With an extensive network of sources and informants, he was the go-to man for any lead or contact needed to solve a case. But as Borg's death rocked the department, suspicions swirled. Was there a cover-up? The FBI investigated, but no charges were brought against Golubsky. And as he continued to climb the ranks, rumors circulated that he kept his sources secret from his fellow officers. He was called a lone wolf by some, while others just called him a damn good detective. But with great power came great scrutiny, and it wasn't long before Golubsky found himself in the hot seat once again. Only time would tell if this detective could keep his secrets hidden and stay one step ahead of the law. The attorneys for the McIntyres knew Golubsky's game all too well. He was like a predator, preying on vulnerable black women who were desperate for his help. But instead of serving and protecting, he used his badge to terrorize and extort sexual favors from them. He would manipulate them into providing false evidence, closing cases, and cementing his reputation as a top detective. But when questioned about his actions, Golubsky clammed up, refusing to answer, citing his Fifth Amendment rights. And it wasn't just one incident. There were multiple occasions where he was caught in the act with a woman while on duty. And even his former police chief couldn't recall the specific incident, conveniently forgetting the actions of his star detective. Now facing potential criminal prosecution, Golubsky had nowhere to hide. The accusations against him were grave and he couldn't deny hearing them before. This wasn't just corruption, this was rape and coercion at the hands of a supposed protector of the law. The retired 68-year-old sat in silence, knowing that his past was finally catching up to him. Roger Golubsky was a top cop in Kansas City, Kansas for over three decades, rising through the ranks from patrol officer to detective, and finally captain. But when Lamont McIntyre was released from his wrongful imprisonment for two murders, questions were raised about Golubsky's methods. Rumors of exploiting vulnerable black women for sexual favors, coercing them into providing false testimony, and even raping one woman who he promised to help free her children from legal trouble, began to surface. And now, sitting in a plush law office facing attorneys with a track record of taking down crooked cops, Golubsky invokes his Fifth Amendment rights as he is questioned about his questionable tactics. Freudenberger, a powerhouse attorney known for representing victims of police misconduct and those wrongfully convicted like O.J. Simpson, presses Golubsky with tough questions while McIntyre and his mother watch from Zoom. But, as expected, Golubsky refuses to answer under the guidance of his attorney. This isn't the first time Pilot, Runnels, and their team have taken on Golubsky. They were the ones who successfully proved McIntyre's innocence after Golubsky manipulated witnesses to falsely identify him as the killer in a 1994 case. Roach, Golubsky's attorney, remains tight-lipped about his client's responses during the deposition, but has denied all accusations against him in the McIntyre's lawsuit. But with such strong evidence and skilled lawyers on the other side, will Golubsky be able to continue evading justice? Only time will tell in this ongoing battle between truth and corruption in the KCK Police Department. Freudenberger's interrogation tactics painted a picture of corrupt superiors within the Kansas City Police Department, who were well aware of Golubsky's illicit activities with prostitutes, mostly drug addicts, and vulnerable women coerced into submission by law enforcement. But instead of taking action, they turned a blind eye, or perhaps even encouraged it. The current spokesperson for KCKPD, Nancy Chartrand, claims that all those involved in the case have since retired or moved on, leaving no one to comment on the sordid details. 
The lawsuit names not only Golubsky, but also various colleagues from the department and the unified government of Wyandotte County, Kansas City. But this is not the only legal battle Golubsky faces. He may also face criminal charges, making his testimony critical in the ongoing investigation. The Kansas Bureau of Investigation has delved into allegations of sexual assault against Golubsky, as well as any potential connection to the wrongful conviction of Lamont McIntyre. While their investigation did not uncover any violations of state laws within the statute of limitations, they have referred possible federal crimes to the proper authorities. Bridget Patton from the FBI's Kansas City field office could neither confirm nor deny an active investigation, standard protocol in such cases. However, testimonies from McIntyre's exoneration hearing and other cases reveal a disturbing pattern. Golubsky allegedly preying on vulnerable women, particularly black women, and using intimidation to silence them. The details of the McIntyre lawsuit are shocking and disturbing. Testimony from a woman who wishes to stay anonymous reveals decades-old crimes committed by Officer Golubsky. This Kansas City native recalls being raped and forced into oral sex by Golubsky during a search warrant at her home. The officer used his position to manipulate and intimidate this victim, promising to help her children if she complied with his advances. But it didn't stop there. The assaults continued at her residence and even in Golubsky's own police car as he faced criminal charges for her children. This brave woman wanted to report the abuse but feared retaliation from the corrupt culture within the KCK Police Department. And she was not alone. Former FBI Special Agent Alan Jenerick, who investigated corruption within the department in the late 1980s and early 1990s, revealed that 13 or 14 officers were under investigation at one time, only scratching the surface of the true extent of misconduct. In fact, McIntyre's legal team has subpoenaed records from the U.S. Attorney's Office, seeking information on Operation Street Smart, the code name for an investigation into corruption, civil rights violations, drug activity, theft, sexual extortion, and any other illegal activities within the KCKPD. It seems like this operation may have just been the tip of the iceberg. The sly legal team representing McIntyre had more than just a few tricks up their sleeves. They cunningly subpoenaed the Wyandotte County District Attorney's Office for records related to the 2000 murder of Stacey Quinn, a crucial witness in the April 15, 1994 double slaying that landed McIntyre behind bars at just 17 years old. Stacey Quinn had witnessed the brutal murder of Donald Ewing and her own cousin, Daniel Quinn. She stood across the street from the powder blue Cadillac where four shotgun blasts rang out in broad daylight, and she saw everything. But strangely enough, there was no record of Detective Golubsky, who was not even assigned to homicide cases at the time, ever interviewing Stacy. And she never took the stand during McIntyre's trial. In a bold move, McIntyre's team presented a sworn statement from Quinn herself, stating that he was not the shooter on that fateful day. She described the killer as someone who looked nothing like McIntyre and had different physical characteristics. But it seemed like Detective Golubsky was more interested in talking to other witnesses, like Ruby Mitchell and Stacy's sister, Nico Quinn. Both were farther away from the scene and could not see the shooter's face. But here's where things get interesting. Mitchell initially identified McIntyre as the shooter during an interview with police after the shooting and later at trial. However, in a sworn affidavit in 2011, she admitted that she may have mistakenly identified him due to fear and pressure from Detective Golubsky. See, he had a history of making inappropriate comments about women's bodies and even asked Mitchell if she dated white men while driving her to the police station. Nico Quinn had come forth with a damning statement against Detective Golubsky. She claimed he coerced her into falsely identifying McIntyre from a lineup even going so far as to promise her a new place to live in exchange for her compliance. It was clear that Golubsky would do whatever it takes to get a conviction, even if it meant manipulating witnesses and fabricating evidence. But now, with the truth coming to light, it was undeniable that McIntyre was innocent and had been wrongfully convicted. The real question was, who was the true perpetrator? And why did Golubsky go to such lengths to frame an innocent teenager? As time ticked by, so did McIntyre's chances of proving his innocence in this twisted case of injustice. But he wouldn't rest 
until justice was served and the truth was unearthed, no matter how many obstacles stood in his way. The clock was ticking and the evidence was unraveling against him. In this dark game of deception and betrayal, only time would tell who would come out on top. But when Nico Quinn crossed paths with McIntyre in the courthouse, she knew he wasn't the shooter. And when she tried to come forward with this information, prosecutor Tara Moorhead threatened to take away her children if she didn't testify otherwise. But there was another crucial witness that Detective Golubsky conveniently never interviewed, Stacy Quinn. As it turns out, numerous witnesses revealed that Golubsky had been paying Stacy for sex for years, starting when she was just 16 or 17 years old. And when Golubsky took the stand and invoked his right to remain silent, it only added fuel to the fire of suspicion surrounding his involvement in this corrupt case. Quinn's body was found riddled with bullets on a frigid January morning in 2000, discarded like garbage at Quindaro Park. The news would have you believe she was just another nameless victim in this crooked city. But I know the truth. It goes much deeper than that. Marcus Washington Jr., convicted for first-degree murder, did the deed under the guidance of Detective Golubsky and former police chief Terry Zeigler. A deadly duo, some might say. Quinn's brutal death may not be directly tied to the notorious McIntyre case, but his lawyers are digging for any connections to those Wyandotte County prosecutors. Golubsky is a man shrouded in shadows, protected by those in power. But my team managed to unearth some juicy details about his three failed marriages and a hushed-up, annulled marriage. One of his ex-wives even testified under oath about their encounter at a gas station during one of Golubsky's investigations. And it wasn't just a random run-in, no. He had been pursuing her long before she knew anything about the case. Control and power seemed to be Golubsky's driving forces, as revealed by his ex-wife's stories of manipulation and shady financial dealings. And even his own family looked down on her because of the color of her skin. I knew Roger had a thing for black women, she said in her affidavit. When I asked him why, he replied, because they're uneducated. I couldn't believe it. To deal with my hurt feelings, I ended up maxing out credit cards. She thought she had left him behind, but Golubsky was not one to let go easily. Even after their divorce, he stalked her for a decade, always lurking in the shadows and never letting her feel safe. But it wasn't just his obsessive behavior that made him notorious in Kansas City. Ruby Ellington's sworn affidavit revealed a darker side to this former police detective. Golubsky had an insatiable appetite for black prostitutes, specifically those who were drug addicted and powerless. And according to Ellington, this was no secret within the police department. Former Mayor Mark Holland even spoke up about Golubsky's reputation, citing credible allegations of him extorting sex from black women in the community. And while Golubsky may have been able to cover up his actions before, things were about to unravel. Lamont McIntyre was just 17 years old when he was sent to prison for 25 years for a crime he didn't commit. And it was all thanks to Golubsky's dubious testimony and the cover-up by the Wyandotte County Justice System. But as complaints against Golubsky continued to surface during his time with the KCKPD, it became clear that this former detective was not above using his power and influence for his own twisted desires. The list of complaints against Officer Golubsky was long and disturbing. Some were dismissed as unfounded by the police department, while others resulted in no disciplinary action. One particularly unsettling incident from 2009 involved Golubsky and his fellow officers searching a woman's apartment during a murder investigation. As they threatened her and searched for her boyfriend, Golubsky made a chilling statement about hauling her black ass in for aiding and abetting. And if that wasn't enough, he then proceeded to judge her based on the photos on her wall, warning her to change the type of men she dates because they're all criminals. But this was just one complaint, dating back to 2005 when it was alleged that Golubsky had put a woman's safety at risk by revealing her status as an FBI informant. The case was closed due to lack of cooperation from the accuser. And yet, despite these troubling reports, Golubsky retired in 2010 with a full pension and went on to work as a detective for the Edwardsville Police Department. 
But that didn't last long when questions arose about his involvement in securing the conviction of Jesse McIntyre Jr., which gained media attention thanks to rigorous investigative reporting by the Star. Eventually, Golubsky left the Edwardsville Department in October 2016. His next job? Security at Providence Medical Center in Kansas City, Kansas. However, this too did not last long as he was terminated from his position without explanation. When asked about it in a deposition, Golubsky pleaded the Fifth Amendment, invoking his right to remain silent. No surprise there. In November of 2023, five brave women stepped forward to take on a corrupt system. They sued the government for turning a blind eye to police misconduct and allowing a predator to run rampant in Kansas City, Kansas. This ain't no small accusation. This is a statement. These women say the unified government of Wyandotte County and Kansas City let its officers terrorize, abuse, and violate black residents without any consequences. There's always two sides to every story, but you won't be hearing from the government or Roger Golubsky's lawyer anytime soon. They're keeping their mouths shut because they know what's coming. Feds say Golubsky framed black citizens and preyed on black women and girls for years in Kansas City. And he's not just facing one indictment, but two sexual assault and kidnapping charges that span from 1998 to 2002 and being part of a sex trafficking ring involving underage girls from 1996 to 1998. But don't worry, folks. He's innocent until proven guilty, right? That's why he's chilling at home on house arrest. No trial date set yet, though. Out of those five fierce ladies, four claim Golubsky assaulted them in some way or another. One even says he raped her in his unmarked cop car back in 92. And get this. When one of the women said she was going to report him, what did Golubsky have to say? Report me to who? The police? I am the police. Well, well, well. Looks like this detective thought he was above the law, but not anymore. Not if these women have anything to say about it. Thank you for tuning in to No Tears for Black Girls, now a part of the Alive Podcast Network. The first black female-owned and operated network dedicated to amplifying black voices. If you enjoyed this episode, please show your support by following us on the Alive Podcast app, available on both iPhone and Android. You can also stay connected with us on social media and YouTube at No Tears for Black Girls, or on X at No Tears for BG. Remember to stay loved, stay blessed, and stay safe. Until next time.